Aloha, the book of Nahum, or Nahum, however you wish to pronounce it. Three chapters, 47 verses, 1,285 words in the King James Bible. Nahum, Nahum is the book of Nineveh's apostasy and destruction. Thank you, Father God, for your word. May this edify, encourage, and enlighten us. In Christ's name, amen. Now, the book of Nahum. Nahum here, contemporary with Micah. And that's about it. Isaiah, uh, his name's so long I couldn't fit it, but uh, Nahum is by himself. He doesn't overlap with Isaiah. Now this is some, what, 150 years at least after Jonah came to Nineveh. So the, the, the book of uh, Nahum is about Nineveh's destruction. Jonah had been told to preach. We saw in Jonah. God told Jonah, go and preach to Nineveh. You'll be overthrown in 40 days. And Nineveh repented. They changed their mind and they turned from their evil way. And so Nineveh was spared. But now 150 something years later, Nahum says, Nineveh, you've turned from the one true God. Nahum, the, the 34th book in the Bible canon, written by, of course, Nahum the prophet, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. So let's go on to, I'll read first before I comment anymore. Nahum 1.1, 1, 1, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. Where was, it, it, Nahum says, uh, the Elkoshite, where, where is that? Well, we don't know. Perhaps it was Capernaum, Capernaum, with Nahum's name in it. I don't know. The burden of Nineveh, there's a heavy message to pass on the Nineveh, one of wrath, judgment. So Dr. Schofield, using Usher's date, has Nahum at about 713 B.C. And they had Jonah at 862 B.C., which is what, about 150 years earlier, before Nahum here that Jonah went to Nineveh. Nahum here, three divisions of the book. Nineveh's doom determined, chapter 1. Nineveh's destruction described, chapter 2. Nineveh's desolation deserved, chapter 3. <laughs> the alliteration there, how about that? Six major events or themes here. Nineveh's apostasy. Nineveh is special in her apostasy. I'll tell you why. Two, Nineveh's destruction. It happened in 612 B.C. The Babylonians and the Medes and others allied to overthrow Nineveh, the capital of Assyria there. There's the fifth course of judgment on Israel. There's the second coming of Christ. Israel restored from the fifth course of chastisement. And then finally the millennium. The key verse, Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. We'll read those shortly. Nahum, the twelfth book in the prophetic order. It's number seven in the Minor Prophets. Nahum, comfortable. It means comfortable, comforting. Nothing else is known about him, though. Why is he comforting? Well, he's certainly not comforting Nineveh, but he's comforting Israel. Israel's chief enemy here, Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, the Assyrians, they'll be destroyed. So Israel sh should take comfort. Just like with Obadiah and the destruction of Edom, Israel's enemies, all of Israel's haters are destroyed at the second coming. 
We have Esau's descendants destroyed. We have, of course, here Nahum, the Assyrians destroyed. And Habakkuk will talk about the Babylonians are destroyed. So Israel's to take comfort in that. They've mistreated Israel and now God pays them back. So Nahum chapter 1 verse 1. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Here's the second coming now. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds or the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him. There is the second coming. And the hills melt the fire and the earth is burned in his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide? It's the believer. Verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. Ooh. There is one come out of thee, that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. The Antichrist is really, he's called the Assyrian. That's, there's the Antichrist. And that's how we know Nineveh's destruction by Babylon in 612 BC. That was just a hint of the destruction that's coming, the second coming. Because out of Nineveh, out of Assyria, the Antichrist comes. Now, a wicked counselor, historically, that of course is Sennacherib. Sennacherib, he attacked Judah. He tried to overthrow Jerusalem in 701 BC with Hezekiah. And God prevented that. He sent the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord smote the Assyrians. 185,000, 2 Kings 19. It's a picture of the Antichrist trying to destroy Jerusalem. And it won't work. Verse 12, Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, and that's Israel, I will afflict thee no more. The Assyrian captivity ends. The Assyrians came to judge. The fifth course is over. For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and I will burst thy bonds in sunder. He frees them from the captivity. God frees Israel from the fifth course of chastisement. Brings them back into the land. Frees them from their Gentile oppressors. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be stoned. Out of... The house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image. There is a second coming. And the molten image. I will make thy grave. For thou art fall. Be, behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. That publisheth peace. That sounds like in Isaiah, huh? And also Romans 10. Beautiful are the feet of them that bring good tidings. Good news. The gospel that publish peace. Well, Nahum is bringing some good news. Nineveh's destroyed. Israel's enemies here are destroyed. They can't per persecute Israel anymore. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts. Perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. So chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 1. 
He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition. This is Nineveh's destruction. Watch the way. Make thy loins strong. Fortify thy power mightily. Nineveh, get ready. Judgment's coming. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob, as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another. They're hurrying. They're preparing for battle. Nineveh is preparing to defend herself. They shall jostle one against another in the broad streets. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the fence shall be prepared. Now, ancient Nineveh. See, just like there was an ancient Babylon, and there'll be a new Babylon, the Antichrist will have a new Babylon. There's an ancient Nineveh, and there must be a, a future Nineveh too, as well as there was ancient Edom, and there's a new Edom. And God gets rid of all of Israel's enemies, ultimately at the second coming. And there are hints of that in history, when those Gentiles were, were defeating each other in the centuries before Christ. Well here, historically, ancient Nineveh, I pointed that out in Jonah, the inner city wall was like eight miles around. Their wall, they had over 1,500 defense towers to defend the city. 200 feet high, these towers. Now verse 6, Nahum 2, 6, The gates of the rivers shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. And Huzup shall be led away captive, she shall be brought up, and her maids shall lead her, as with the voice of doves, tabering upon their breasts, mourning. But Nineveh is of old, like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away, stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take ye the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and the glory out of all the pleasant furniture. Assyria had conquered these nations and had all this wealth, and God says, go take it, take, take it from Nineveh. Nineveh stole it from others, now you go and take it from Nineveh. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins. And the faces of them all gather blackness. They're burned. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, even the old lion, walked. And the lions whelp, and none made them afraid. The lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps, and strangled for his lionesses. And filled his holes with prey, and his dens with raven flesh. Verse 13, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. And I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions. And I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. Judgment. I will devour. I'll burn her chariots in the smoke. The sword will devour, the young lions will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messenger shall no more be heard. Woe to the bloody city, that's Nineveh. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not, the noise of a whip, and the noise of the rattling of the wheels, and of the prancing horses, and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain, and a great number of carcasses. And there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. There are so many dead bodies all over. They stumble over the bodies. Because of the multitude, and they run over the bodies. 
Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts, false religion has gotten a hold of Nineveh. And in, in the future, too, with Antichrist, that's where he comes from, the Assyrian, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and will set thee as a gazing stock. Everybody will see. Oh, look at that example there. It will come to pass that all that look upon thee shall flee from thee, and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who shall bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? Art thou better than populous No? It's a city in Egypt. That was situate among the rivers that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubam were thy helpers, yet was she carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets, and they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid, thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees. With the first ripe figs, if they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. You wobble the tree and the fruit falls, the women Weak, see, the gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Go into clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. Cut, cut thee off. It'll eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Thy crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria, Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee, the news, shall clap the hands over thee. They're rejoicing. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? All around, when, when Nineveh's when, when the Assyrians slaves see Assyria Assyria was conquering all the nations round about and of course they'll conquer the northern kingdom and almost get into Jerusalem but God will stop that in Hezekiah's day but the fifth, fifth course of judgment Assyria was conquering all these various people around, like we saw in Isaiah. And once the Assyrians' enemies hear about Nineveh's fall, the enemies of, of, of Assyria, of course, rejoice. Hey, the one who tormented us and defeated us, and mistreated us. Now they've been defeated. The Babylonians. In 612 or so. The Babylonians. Conquered. The Assyrians. And then see shortly Nebuchadnezzar. Comes to power there. And he'll take over. The southern kingdom. Judah. He'll invade Jerusalem three times. So that's, that's the order there. Going back to Jonah, 
Let's go back to Jonah. Jonah and Nahum should be compared. Now Jonah and Nahum are like 150 years apart. Jonah was told, Jonah 1 verse 2, and we saw this in Jonah, but we'll, we'll repeat. God instructed Jonah, arise, Jonah 1 2, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Evil Ninevites. Now in Jonah 3, Jonah preaches. Look at Jonah 3, verse 4. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God, Yea, let them turn every one from his way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he had said he would do unto them and he did it not. Nineveh's wicked. Jonah, you go and preach to them. No, I'm not going. Well, Jonah had a, a turning around there with the, the fish, the whale, the aquatic sea monster, whatever it was, aquatic animal. Nineveh. Go to Nineveh, Jonah, and Jonah went. Nineveh will be overthrown in 40 days. The Nineveh repented. They changed their mind, and God changed his mind. Repentance doesn't mean sorrow for sin, because it says God repented. Change the mind, thinking properly. The Ninevites are thinking properly now. And because they, they changed the way they thought, no longer idolatrous, now they're thinking divine because of Jonah's preaching. Now God says, well, I was going to do this. I was going to judge them. Since they changed, I'll change. And I, I changed my mind. See, somebody who says, oh, God never changes. Well, his nature doesn't change. But he does change his mind. And in that case, he did change his mind. And he says, I thought to do it. And I decided, no, I'm not going to do it. God changes his dealings with man when man changes. Since Nineveh changed, God changed his mind. God changed his dealings with Nineveh because Nineveh changed their dealings with him. That's how the God of the Bible works. God wanted them to repent. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. A change in mind. Think like the Creator God would want you to think. Don't fall for the false religion for Satan and his life program. Nineveh. I pointed this out in Jonah. I'll point it out again. Nineveh. Come back to Genesis 10. Genesis 10. Genesis 10, 8. Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinor. That's Babylon. Babel, Babylon, Shinor. Look at chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Uh, Genesis 10, 11. Out of that land went forth Asher, that's Assyria. 
and built at Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Kalna. Nineveh and Babylon originated from this pagan idolater Nimrod, this rebel, unbeliever. He was responsible. He was trying to form a one world religion, a one world government there in Genesis 11. Don't scatter, like God said, after the flood. We're going to all stay in one region and we build a tower. A religious system. The whore of Babylon is what they'll be. The Antichrist will pick that up one day. Nineveh was involved with false religion, pagan idolatry, all going back to Nimrod thousands of years earlier. Jonah came in. They let go of those idols. Jonah's preaching, the message Jonah preached was believed, and Nineveh was spared wrath. Now, can't come to Nahum. Many decades have passed, many decades have passed, uh, a century and a half as much. The Ninevites have gone back the way of heathenism. Now, as you recall, in Romans 1, God gave the nations over to the idols, and as he's dealing with Israel there, at the Tower of Babel. But in the case of Nineveh, God sent Jonah, and Nineveh heard from the one true God. Nineveh was a Gentile city, who heard a word from the one true God. So they weren't like the, the rank and file Gentiles of that day. They heard from Israel's God, the God of creation. And they believed God in, in the book of Jonah. Now, the, at the time of Nahum, they have not only are they pagan, they're pagan again. They've left the one true God's revelation to them. They're an apostate Gentile nation. They're not just a, a Gentile nation at the bottom there with the rest of the Gentiles. But at one time, they had some light with Jonah. And they've rejected that light. And so God, the God of Israel, the God of creation, takes offense. Nineveh. You had my word, and you left it. So the judgment falls on Nineveh there. The judgment falls on Nineveh. There's a historical application. Nineveh was destroyed. The Babylonians came in. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it. And now... The Antichrist will come one day, the Assyrian, another Assyrian, and Nineveh will be destroyed at the second coming. There's a, another Nineveh that will show up, evidently, just like there's another Babylon that will come up. Remember, Nahum, the second coming, is in chapter 1 there. The fire of the second coming. Now, in the mid-1800s, Nineveh was excavated, and the place was massive. So yes, the Bible is not a book of fairy tales. There really was a Nineveh, just like the book of Nahum said there was, just like Jonah said there was. And it was a great city. It was a massive city. Back in Jonah's time, I pointed out Something like 600,000 citizens up to a million citizens. And then Nahum comes later. There could, there could be more people. Well, surely there would be more people uh, compared to Jonah's day. But uh, uh, several hundred thousand people in Nineveh. And God destroyed it historically, and there'll be something to loop forward to the future, another destruction.
And this one will last forever. So that is the book of Nahum. Short and sweet lesson there. Nahum. Father God, thank you for your word. In Christ's name, amen.